Welcome to the Filmmakers 412 podcast. I'm your host, Michael Ray. Today's guest is Jim McCurio. Jim is a screenwriter, filmmaker, and screenwriting coach. In today's interview, we talk about everything screenwriting. Here's today's guest, Jim McCurio. Jim, welcome to the podcast. Hey. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. So tell me, what do you do when you're not um, screenwriting? Well, I, I kind of try to like follow my passion. So most of my living is made from being a teacher, uh, uh, story analyst, consultant. I work with a lot of clients, helping them, their scripts get better. So, you know, I have uh, I get some uh, odd jobs here and there as a writer, but then I complement it with, uh, you know, helping writers, teaching, you know, my book. Uh, I have a DVD set that I'm going to try to put online. So basically, it's a way for me to stay kind of connected and doing the stuff that I love, even though it's not always, you know, being the writer or the director for for a film. You don't have a nine to five. You're strictly freelance in the screenwriting industry, more or less. Some people might argue that being the teacher or the consultant or story analyst is a separate thing. And it might be. I mean, it's education versus, you know, the actual creative act. However, um, I enjoy it. I get to, like, as an extrovert, I get to like talk to people, wrestle with them, be creative. So it's using the same muscles. It's uh, it's using my kind of creativity and talents towards the thing I love. So if you want to call that the same industry, I sure, I'll take that, it. I call that same, a full-time professional. Cool. So how'd you get into this? Give us a brief history. Um, You know what? My, my parents didn't go to college. So I went to college and just because I was good at math in high school, I was a math major. But then I started like realizing, wow, man, I really love films. So... By the end of uh, undergraduate, I basically turned my math degree into a film degree. And then after I did my master's in Michigan, I went to L.A. for a decade or so. And then uh, came back here and kind of getting ready to head back to one of the coasts, New York or uh, L.A. I always tell a story about my friend Sean Kanan. He's an actor. He was the bad guy in Karate Kid 3. And uh, we grew up together in uh, Newcastle, a small town, about an hour from here. And his father owned some stores growing up, and he was the very first person to have like VHS or the Betamax or whatever they were called back then. And he would bring movies home on the weekend, but he would bring movies home uh, that he wanted to see. So it was like The Godfather, uh, French Connection, Serpico kind of movies. So it's like I actually have this weird, like even as a kid, I was watching these really serious movies, these gritty 70s movies. And that's kind of like where I got um, some of my taste for movies. So in some ways, I always uh, give him crap for, uh, you know, being the cause of that. Was there an aha moment when you said, you know, I want to be a screenwriter? Or do you consider yourself a screenwriter or do you consider yourself a movie maker? I mean, I probably had this uh, egotistical, uh, unrealistic idea that, oh, you know what? I'll do what everybody else does. I'll write screenplays so I can have a chance to direct. But, you know, directing is hard. Like, it's, it takes a lot of money. It takes, you know, a lot of resources. So... I was developing my screenwriting as was, as I was going along, and yeah, no, I do love and in this and because I love movies. In my very first screenplay, it was almost like therapy. Like there was something in my life that was going on. I was young, uh, in college, and I just had this story I wanted to tell. And I was taking these classes, and there were maybe two books out at the time. Well, actually, there were more, but like I picked up Sid Field or Richard Walter and just was reading it. My senior year of college, when I knew I was kind of done with math and I was going to you know go on and try to be a writer and filmmaker, um, I wrote my very first screenplay, which won actually a big award at Michigan which is always kind of funny, but um, like, like I need to tell stories. So the last 10 years, the business has been tough. I mean, I made a handful of feature films, but I've kind of like gone back to being the journeyman screenwriter uh, the last few years because paper's cheap. You can always be working on your craft. You can always be writing. So yeah, I mean, I feel like in my heart and soul, I'm a director. My writing even is influenced by it and then vice versa. My, my writing influences my directing. Uh, I don't know. I call myself a filmmaker, but probably because I can do it more often, you know, as a screenwriter, it's probably a skill I've developed even more. Like I would consider myself probably uh, a better screenwriter than director only because of the uh, opportunity. What do you like to do better? Directing, or I should say d directing is easier or it's be not easier. It's easier for me. Like as an extrovert, like I do the work, you get prepared and then you show up and you're talking to people and you're using them and you're inspiring them and you're relying on them and you're getting everybody to kind of do their best work. I mean, as an extrovert, yeah, it's definitely sometimes hard to sit there for hours and hours and hours on 20 drafts as a screenplay. So yeah, I mean, directing is more, it doesn't drain me, like it gives me energy, but at the same time, it's hard. Like only a few times I've had like a sandbox of, fifty hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars to play with. So 
They haven't been my scripts. They haven't been necessary scripts I would uh, choose to make. But, you know, like the, I did a horror film. I'm a person who would like to make Annie Hall. But I got a chance to make a horror film, you know, in Detroit. And I did what I could do with that. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I think writing, I think screenwriting is something that uh, a lot of us have to be, be not realistic about, but it's a skill that we can develop and constantly keep. And there's no excuse to like not be doing it as opposed to directing, uh, especially where like I don't make so many shorts. I feel like the the narrative form that I know and love and feel is like feature films where you're developing characters, where you're creating a world, where you're taking your time sometimes with it. So I don't get a chance to do this as anywhere near as often as I'd like to. So screenwriting kind of by default kind of takes over. And in fact, in fact, one of my regrets is that for the 10 years when I was making movies in the, you know, in the 2000s, I was thinking to myself, or maybe subconsciously, I was like, well, yeah, I don't need to be writing as much because I'm, you know, I'm a filmmaker now. But you know what? I feel like I missed some opportunities to like have written a few more scripts and have developed my craft faster. But so now I'm like, uh, you know, even, even if I'm a filmmaker, even if I have a chance to direct something, which like, I think I'm going to be able to direct a short in a few months if this stuff uh, clears up. Um, I, I had a short set up to direct like right around now. And of course, you know, things have changed, but I'm not going to stop writing now because that's something that kind of gives you power and you own it. And it basically hones your storytelling skills. This really surprises me because when I was researching you, I kept on running across screenwriter, screenwriter, screenwriter. I didn't realize you had such a passion for directing. So a lot of my questions are sort of That's in another folder somewhere. But um, I think from my observations, only being in this whole thing for like a year and a half, I think pretty much every filmmaker is in your situation in that they can spend a whole lot more time writing than directing. Right. Um, I kind of kid about it like because I'm an extrovert it's really easy for me to be on a set and have meetings and talk to people and also kind of my personality type MB, MBTI if you want is like a champion I like seeing people I like getting them excited I like seeing what they do best and using them so that's a skill that is obviously very natural for a director what happens is my ability to do that in writing happens internally like I see the best in characters. I think I can write surprisingly interesting characters that have like a strong multiple perspective where I can, where I have the multiple perspective to write really strong, interesting characters. So it's like my skills are related. I mean, those skills are related and they're helpful, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier for me, like energy wise, like, like directing completely just kind of fuels me. I actually had a pretty strong presence in the niche of like screenwriting education. I became friends with Eric Bauer who started creative screenwriting God, like 26 years ago, and I started writing for the magazine. And one of the reasons I did that was I went to University of Michigan. I got a master's in film, not an MFA, but it was film, not necessarily screenwriting. And I had won a really cool um, award there. And I always say it's one by Arthur Miller and Larry Kasdan. I mean, it's good company, right? But I didn't really feel like I had the complete education. So my first few years in Los Angeles while I was writing, I also took it upon myself to read every book to go to all the classes. In fact, I was creative about it. I said to uh, creative screenwriting, I said, let me go take all the classes from McKee and uh, Walter and Field and uh, Jeff Kitchen kind of friend. And basically, let me write about it. So basically, I got like, I don't know, a couple hundred hours of free classes to basically write about. In fact, I got paid. And then eventually, I directed the 40 DVDs in the Screenwriting Expo series. So I literally sat there and watched these... Uh, I don't know, 100 hours of stuff and then watch them being edited. So like I watched those 100 hours uh, two or three times. So I kind of created um, uh, an interesting, I basically created deliberate practice. Like I figured out a way for me to be immersed in it, to do it. And even as a story analyst, as I started getting good at it and getting clients, it's still good because it keeps me thinking about it. It keeps me challenged, you know, it keeps me challenged. So if I have a client who's better than I am or who has pieces or part of the writing that's better than I am, I love that. Because I can compliment them, but then also I can learn too. And uh, so it's a good thing. So basically like being a teacher and story analyst and even like writing my book all came out of like, I wanted to stay connected. I knew I needed to get something out of this. So I basically created like uh, my own, like, I don't know, little post-grad school to understand it. So I've just been immersed in it so long that writing a book just kind of made sense. So, so how'd you end up in Pittsburgh with all that aspiration? I grew up. I grew up in Newcastle, a small town about an hour from here, and I went away as soon as I got out of high school. 
And uh, I was in L.A. for 15 years. I was l- going back and forth in the East Coast a little bit. And I came back a few years ago, just kind of in between doing a few things. And I've been here a little bit longer than I wanted to. So uh, I'm here. I've met, like, you know, hundreds of people. I, I always say I feel like I'm an outsider or I'm trying to get back to the coast. But I look at my Facebook. I'm like, wait, I've got, like, 200 Pittsburgh filmmaking friends here. So, uh, you know, I have a fondness for it. I feel like uh, L.A. and New York is, is definitely calling again. And right now, obviously, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Right now, the, the the way of the world right now is making it a little bit harder. So what's your plan? Like, you, you sound like you're trying to get back to the West Coast and make it big. And what's what would be a step-by-step plan for making it big? Like, for, uh, for any aspiring screenwriter. Um, like, how do they simple, go about that? It's simple, really, right. Like, I have a couple scripts now that I really like that one of them is calculated, calculatedly commercial. The other one isn't something that is commercial, but like in the vein of girls or Fleabag or, you know, some of these like auteur-driven dramedies like Better Things, which is probably uh, my favorite TV show right now. Um, I have two really good samples working on some other stuff. So I'm marketing myself, but it's just hard. The industry has changed so much. Like, for instance, one of the things we did with Creative Screening back in the day I helped, uh, I ran the contest for the Screenwriting Expo, which was the world's largest trade show for screenwriters. The last year, maybe 2007 or eight, uh, there were four or 5,000 screenwriters out in LA at the conference center. Mm. It doesn't even exist anymore. So the whole niche of screenwriting and people kind of uh, following their dreams and it being a viable thing, it's so, um, it's so far away and it's so hard now that I think a lot of people have been discouraged or... If you want to take it seriously, man, it's, you got to be take it seriously. You got to treat it like a business. You got to write. You got to study. You have to get better. You have to be open to feedback. You basically have to, uh, I don't know, you have to use your time wisely. And basically, what's next? What's next? What's next? I I'm not a super fast writer because I think more like a director. Like I want I want something to be really complete, almost ready to go. Like you can read it and say, you know what, that could be shot next week. Uh, some people pump out scripts two, three a year. Um, I'm more closer to like one a year, but the idea is you just got to write because one, you get better Two, when you have the networking and the contacts that you need, you have something to show them. But here's the thing. You can write the best script in the world, but someone might even say, you know what? I love this. This is an amazing script, but it's not the thing I'm looking for. So you have to have like in your arsenal, uh, you know, several scripts that, that show off your voice and some variations of it too. So what about genre? Do, do most successful screenwriters sort of dwell in one or two genres? Or they? A lot of working screenwriters have a specialty, and they do it. They sort of get you know pigeonholed uh, a little bit. Like I was I, by choice, they, they get pigeonholed. No, no because they, I mean, their agents who are pushing them, who are trying to make you know three, four, five hundred thousand dollar deals, or or just get them work. Uh, they know what they're good at. They know what their strength is. They know what they can sell. You know, like if someone is writing a comedy all the time, like and they go to a, a, and the agent goes to the producer and says, yeah, he has this really cool idea for a little drama. He's like, yeah, that's nice. But I mean, we're not going to pay for it. We're not going to risk that. So I was watching that zombie movie with uh, Woody Harrelson, Jesse Eisenberg. And I was like, man, this is really funny. This is surprisingly funny because I don't really like horror. And like you were talking before, I don't necessarily do zombie films. And I was like, wow, who wrote this? And surprise, it was the guys who wrote um, Deadpool, which is also very funny. Wow. So it's like, yeah, I mean, if you're going to pay someone a million bucks and probably more for Deadpool, uh, you want them, you want proof that it's not just like a one-off thing. They write comedy. They write it well. They're very funny. So, you know, just... I can't even think of what other movies they've done, but those two off the bat, those were really funny and really good at what at what they do. And also, if you want to be a screenwriter, I mean, like my clients, I'm not going to tell you what to write. Like if they want to write whatever, at some point we'll have a conversation about it. But it's like, yeah, if you can write a low budget, high concept movie um, and then get good at, at the genre, that's probably the most practical advice I have for you. You know, so something like, you know, District 9 or Source Code or, you know, like a clever movie like uh, Liar, Liar, or, you know, Freaky Friday, you know, real crisp concept, uh, not super huge budget for what it is. I think that's a very calculated thing. Now, I don't talk about business that much, but when I do, it's like modestly budgeted and hopefully concept. Because if you have a $100 million movie or script that you've written, there's, I don't know, 
five people in all of Hollywood that can make that movie. If you have a $20 million movie, there's 50 or 100. And if you have a $2 million movie, there's two, 300 people that can make that movie, you know, as far as companies or people who've made, uh, you know, m- movies like that. So it's just basically increasing your odds. Hmm. So what do you think your strengths are as a writer? I think one of the things I've done lately is kind of like found my voice. In my pilot, I can say this. No one else in the world could have written that but me. That's good and bad. Someone might say, that's so specific. Yeah, we don't want this. That's not for us. Okay, that's fine. However, if you like it, if you want it, or if you want more of that kind of, uh, that voice, guess what? You can only come to me. So it's like, rather than practicing being really good in one specific genre, I'm kind of finding my voice uh, is the thing that kind of drives things. Like I have, I have a dramedy that's very serious. It's uh, the characters are open about sexuality. Uh, they're very frank in the way they talk. So like you'll you'll they'll say things that you usually don't see. And but you know what? Better things. Fleabag. Girls. Uh, some of these shows that I think are amazing. It's interesting. They're all female uh, directors or auteurs. Um, it has elements of that. So it's like I think that's part of it. And then. Uh, I, I think I have a weird sense of humor. Like I, I wrote a comedy that was supposed to be like a Jed Apatow, just unapologetically, you know, silly and commercial. And then people keep saying like Coen Brothers, Coen Brothers. I'm like, I wasn't trying for Coen Brothers. I was trying to be silly and juvenile. But um, I don't know. I, I have a sense of humor. I mean, I think in general sense of humor or, or comedy is a little bit of a, you know, a preference for people that either they kind of get it or don't. I don't know. I feel like in all that I do, not that I'm preachy at all, I think – it all has some thematic idea. It all has like some importance to it. Like even my fluffy comedy is, is about trust and uh, being paranoid and like, you know, in love and how relationships work. So I feel like I always have some real emotional core that's important. And I think I give characters their due. I think like I really try hard for my female characters to be as strong as the male characters. And in general, like it's really easy to write one character stronger than the other. Usually it's the one that you associate with or the ones whose perspective is more like yours. But I feel like for drama, you have to rise up or make the characters rise up so that they meet each other at an equal level for comedy, for drama, or whatever. So I feel like expecting characters, always having some sense of importance, and then you probably have to read it to, to, to feel it. But... Um, I think there's a certain honesty and certain, uh, you know, frankness and uh, uh, ability to not be afraid to show some characters uh, in their complexity and in their dark side, too. About your voice, try to articulate that a little better. I mean, voice, like, oh, like style. Go back. Like, to I'm a commercial thing. photographer, so right. I have a style. And I found out that that style, when I, when I think back and I analyze it, my style is based on my tools, my, my lights a lot of times, or what, my favorite lens or right. things like that. So when you talk about your voice, what does that mean? What does that equal? Like what uh, is your voice? Try to articulate it. Well, now remember, sometimes my answers become, not can, but because I'm, I'm a filmmaker and writer, but also I've done a lot of time uh, talking about this, teaching about it. There's, there are two chapters about voice in my book. So I don't give you a canned answer, but sometimes I'll have like, Hmm, philosophical answer. Well, I'll ask you, what's what's your style as a photographer? Well, my style is based off of one light I have over there. Like I do a lot of food photography. Okay. And that I've learned how to use that light very well. I mean, right. it's it's so it's so crisp right. that I can use a mirror to reflect right. light back, whereas most lights you can't. I mean, it's like so it's based on the environment that I was in and it's become my, you know, my trademark. And okay. people can recognize me by the light. In my class, I asked students to name a few things that are specific about them. And like for myself, I was like, well, I'm a huge Springsteen fan. I've seen like 50 shows. I have a math undergraduate degree to go along with my filmmaking. I said, how many three or four things would you have to put together and then intersect so that you're like the most unique person in the world or your top 10? Like how many Springsteen fans, huge Springsteen fans I've seen over 50 concerts, have a math degree, have won have cashed in a World Series of Poker event. And it's not so much that these things are great. I'm just trying to be specific. And uh, now this might be cheating, like whose father owned a pizza shop growing up, right? Like like how many people in the world are like that? A hundred, ten, five? So the idea is as you get more specific and if you intersect all the things that are interesting about you, you get to a thing that can only be you. Because I mean, obviously I could cheat. I could say University of Michigan, the master's in film, an undergraduate in math, 
who's seen Springsteen 50 times, who can recite 200 of his songs on the spot without even thinking. How many people in the world can do that? Now, you might not want to do that. <laughs> How does that translate to directing, though? No, it writing? translates to voice. If you just look at the three or four or five things you do that no one else does or that you do better, you get to something that's completely unique. So like, you know, in my book, I talk about the voice. It's like if you take your concept and your character and your theme and your location and you're filtering everything through there, you end up with something that's totally unique. If a line can only be spoken in that context, you know, like in Liar Liar, the judge says, who the hell did this thing? Who beat you up? He's like, a crazy madman at the end of his rope. Aha. That can only be a line in that movie because he has to tell the truth. Yes, he means himself, but it's like the way he says it is unique to the concept. So the idea is your voice is a thing that only you can do. So like, I'm good with dialogue. Um, I'm not afraid to be um, sexual or psychologically twisted or to be dark or to let characters be dark. Um, I, I have a, a way like a Woody Allen Woody Allen skill of letting characters be neurotic and let their thought process actually be sometimes the action. So sometimes a character will go on and on and on for a couple of paragraphs, but the beat is very clear, like, oh, they're avoiding or they're doing something else, but it's like I'm able to capture capture. I'm able to capture neurotic characters and the way they talk and people's way their mind works. And then as a craft thing, like, you know, I think I can write pretty tight. I think I have a funny sense of humor. Also, um, just storytelling. Like, I also happen to know, you know, a lot about film history and other films and stuff. So sometimes I put in homages in there or sometimes I can play with uh, conventions and stuff because, like, I, I, literally I teach it. So it's like they say you have to, you know, learn the rules before you break them. So I do break some rules sometimes. So, yeah, I would say it's all coming down to voices, the thing that only your script can do. And personal voice extends to it's the script that only... You can do. Like I said about my uh, pilot, You, if you know me or if you, if you read it, you realize, wow, there's no one else in the world that could write that. Now, you know, but you can say that about like girls or flea bag or better things. And I think that's the idea is you got to do something that's uniquely you. Now, some people might be a little bit more practical about it. You know what? I'm good at a genre. I can write a really good uh, comedy or horror or thriller. I'm not going to transcend I'm not going to like break every, you know, convention ever, but I'm going to innovate. I'm going to be creative and that's fine. But like, for instance, like my dramedy is, yeah, I want this to be like nothing else that you've seen or, or at least have elements that are like, that are special. You were saying that you've developed a voice, but it sounds as though everybody has a voice and they are just masking it through imitating imitation or something else. Why is it? It's masking it before they've developed it. Well, I feel like. You know, you might be a guy who's funny at parties, who has says things off the cuff or makes your uh, wife or your kids laugh, but that's not craft. It's like, so to be able to totally express your voice in the form of screenwriting, it takes a while and it takes some practice. And, you know, back, we can talk about it later, but the deliberate practice, meaning you have to study and you have to learn and you have to, you know, maybe make movies or maybe have a mentor or a figurative mentor uh, or hire someone like me or you know, basically find some training because, yes, true, everybody has an inner voice as a person, as a personality, but not everybody can immediately translate that into uh, a screenplay. And that's why so many people, I think, they, oh, I watch, I've watched thousands of movies and I have an instinct for it. Yeah, you probably do, but you need to develop the craft. So I would say, yeah, part of this fear, like you want to be able to write what you write and what you're good at, but yeah, you're trying to match something else. You're trying to write Jurassic Park. You're trying to write a movie you've seen before. And, and that's where a lot of people start. But even if you started with just complete creativity and weren't worried about the rules at all, guess what? You kind of have to learn the rules and the craft before, you know, you can surprise yourself with your voice. So yeah, every once in a while, the very first thing someone writes, uh, it's like, wow, the voice is right there on the page. But I think it's something that needs to develop and you're right. It, part of it is just like psychological growth and, and being, you know, uh, an interesting human, but also just the time and experience to have interesting things to say. And then the final piece is the craft to be like, you know what? You're getting pretty good at this. You've kind of gotten some of your bad stuff out of your system. And, you know, what's coming out now is like, oh, you know, that's sort of interesting. That's good. I like that. We're all at a different level of understanding of what we do, the craft. Mm -hmm. um, where did you step up from on that ladder of understanding? Like, what was your least, well, I mean, what was your recent um, understanding, like, 
epiphany that like, oh, this made me better by doing what I'm doing? Is there is there like a I definitive? Well, I keep using the word deliberate practice, and what that means is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has his ten thousand hour rule that that's how long it takes to become good at something. But then this this uh, educational guy named Erickson had this thing and kind of clarified it. it said, no, it's deliberate practice. It's not just doing it. You can't just watch movies. You can't just read scripts. You can't just write. It's like you need some feedback. You need some structure. You need some form. So, uh, for instance, writing my book made me a much better writer. Like, I knew the stuff. It was coming from me, but, but forcing myself to think about it and understanding it at, like, a deeper level and just being immersed in movies and watching scenes and watching clips of movies over and over again as opposed to just watching from beginning to end, I basically become a better writer. So, like, my comedy screenplay has a bunch of set-piece scenes. And I think maybe that's why someone compared it to Coen Brothers because Coen Brothers will do that. They'll have, like, ten flashy scenes. Like, every scene is a little story in and of itself. Well, I did that kind of showing off my voice. So it's like... I think you're constantly learning stuff. And then I had a little personal epiphany, uh, I think last year. I'd seen Fleabag season two, and I was a little bit like, it hurt a little bit because it was so good. And I got discouraged <laughs> a little bit. No, I mean, it was perfect. And um, I said to myself, I, I'm not worthy. And I, and I had that for, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. But I said, no, 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 no. That's the exact opposite thing. I am worthy. I got to be more honest. I have to be just like her and just like put stuff out there that you wouldn't think would be the stuff that should be there. So it's like um, I learned to like go for my voice, not be, I don't know, it's a big word, ashamed of it or just not be embarrassed by it. Just just basically um, I do it if, Own uh, it, if that makes sense. Yeah. In your opinion, what separates a really good screenwriter from a really great screenwriter? It's just basically there's so many things that are necessary to be a great screenwriter. It's like, yeah, if you can do a lot of them, really great. So it's like so many screenwriters like, yeah, they'll be good at theme, but yeah, it'll be a little slow, a little boring. The conflict will be uh, a little bit lacking and there'll be too much exposition. Or someone will be really good at like, uh, you know, conflict and having that, but the character's voices might be a little bit off. Well, the story will be a little bit slow. The story's a little bit like not too super surprising. So it's like, I think... Like one of my jobs as a teacher is like in my scene writing book even, I want to show people what it really is to be great screenwriting, meaning it's not just these five things. There's like these 50 things. Well, not everybody's going to do all 50 of them. So I don't know. It's Maybe this is an unanswer, but it's so hard to be great at it. So if you develop the skills, so these 50 or 100 things that you could be good at, you're just, you're just better at more of them. And you, just, and you understand the medium. You're like, you're visual. Even though even slow dramas still have a sense of efficiency and sort of equippingness to them, that's the nature of screenwriting. And uh, yeah, I don't. That's a good I answer. Think, I think it's a, a culmination answer. of like all those things. And the idea is that not everybody even sees those things to understand what it might be. I, I noticed that in photography too. It's like I call. I mean, I've talked about it before on different podcasts, but it's. I call it the letter, the ladder of understanding. It's like yeah. you're on the you're on this ladder level, right? And you look up to that person higher than you, and you don't know what it is that separates you. You don't know what you don't know. That's that's actually brilliant. You can look down, right. and you can say, oh, this guy just doesn't understand this. But this guy, I don't know what he's doing that I'm not. It's interesting. My friend, who I w he was one of my screenwriting clients, He was uh, I mentored him, and he mentored me in poker. He said, look, when someone does something at the table that you don't know, or you see it's better and different from you, get up and leave. Be very scared because you don't know because it's you don't know how much better they are, they are than you. So it's like where the stakes are like money and getting hurt like that. He's like you have to take that seriously. So yeah, no, I totally get that. And the thing is, uh, I feel like it's about expectations. Like if you can get writers to see what it is it can do, it's a great way to um, get them. Like you don't have to be the one to get them there. Like I don't have to be the one to show you to get to point A to Z. But if you can see Z and I can show that to you, you can get your your own way there. I always tease my clients, my regular clients who've come back, where we have a sense of trust that I'm such a bad consultant or a bad story analyst. Because one of the things sometimes I'll say is when they're at a point where like they don't need me to always give them the answer, because sometimes you don't want to give the answer, you just want them to figure it out. I'll say sometimes, and now this sounds like a really bad note, it's just not special yet. Yeah, it's good. It's not special. Now, they know what that means. Like It's like, yeah, been there, done that. It's the pretty, characters it's aren't. It's pretty vague. It's totally vague, except for when your expectations are... Uh, you read your stuff, you read stuff, and like, that's pretty good. In 10 times, five times, you've rewritten your stuff because it's good. Yeah, okay, a little better. 
yeah, that's pretty good. That's great. You know what? That's amazing. When you've put in that deliberate practice, when you've rewritten something 10, 12, 15 times and realize that's what you're supposed to do, that'll be enough because you'll be like, you know what? Honestly, you're right. It's not special. It is good. It's competent. I'm a good screenwriter. That's good screenwriting. In any contest, that'll win. That'll get you an A in any college class in the country. But do you want to be the big fish small pond? Or are you competing with Billy Wilder, Woody Allen, Judd Apatow, uh, you know, Tony Gilroy, whoever it is you love? So, like, look, when they need it, I will give them specifics. And I'm not always doing that. But a lot of times it's like you just need someone to tell you. You know you can do better. Just do it. And sometimes they'll be like, okay, I'll do it. Or, you know, we'll have a little conversation, but it's like, it's a thing of trust. Like, I know it's like, it's it's purposely, I'm, I'm letting you know that sounds like a really horrible thing, vague thing to say. But that idea of like, you know what, your expectations just need to be higher. And, you know, if you want help, sure. Or if the idea is that eventually they get those expectations themselves, and that's, that's how their writing kind of grows, is they have um, more things that they're trying to do. And then they achieve they achieve more of them because the beginning screenwriter doesn't even know what they're trying to do. They don't even know what they're trying to achieve. So you know, as you understand your your uh, understanding becomes wider, it allows you to become a better screenwriter. That's great. How do you go about generating new ideas? I am not, I am not the kind of guy who just like comes up with a billion ideas just like over and over again. Um, you know, there are ways to do it. You know, you just ask what if. You can look at old movies. Um, I think a lot of people are more like, you know, generation, generation, generating ideas. Uh, m- me personally, it's it's just more personal. There'll just be something, a vibe or a character, maybe even a theme. And I'll start – and everything will start kind of building out of that. I'm not like a person who comes at it from like concept or, or, or you know, what if – the moon's going to blow up and we send a team up there to blow it up first. Like I I don't, you know, Armageddon, even Jurassic Park, uh, those kind of movies, that's not where my mind goes. You know, obviously as a story analyst, we're understanding the industry and storytelling. I work with a lot of those scripts and story ideas with my clients and help them develop them. But me personally, uh, yeah, it's just something, it's a little smaller. It's more like maybe the way a fiction writer might stumble upon a novel idea. That said, um, basically any any what if. I mean, just basically take an interesting concept and ask yourself, hmm, can I make that 90 minutes or two hours long? Can I keep the story within its concept? Like, will that sustain that many interesting ideas? Can I, can I create 15 or 10 or 15 scenes from that idea? Like, you know, a boy shrinks down or, or an older person becomes younger or vice versa. Can I sustain that concept? I think... Uh, yeah, I think the what if is a great way to think about it. Like, what if this happens? And then basically seeing if you can follow it through. So what are some common mistakes you've seen new screenwriters make? I mean, I don't mean to be sarcastic or dismissive, but but all of them, of course. I mean, why wouldn't a beginning a screenwriter uh, make every single mistake? They don't even know the mistakes they're making, which is fine. You just have to do it. It's like, you know, if I went into do brain surgery, how many mistakes would I make? <laughs> right? I would prep wrong. I'd wash my hands wrong. I'd cut them open wrong. Uh, I would not know what things are which. I'd accidentally push and things would bleed. I mean, it would just be ugly. So it's like, yeah. I mean, as a teacher, as someone who's, I'm, I'm a good experienced screenwriter, but also as a person who's taught it and thought about it and put like, you know, thousands of hours into doing this, I'm going to see things that, no, that other people don't. So as a, as a beginning screenwriter, like you said before, you don't know what you don't know, but that's okay. So you just have to do it. And, but the thing is, though, you do know a lot. Like, you know, everybody's got a really great instinct for, or they've been a great audience. They, they do know the language, whether they know it or not. So there'll be a lot of good things in anybody's given a screenplay, but of course they're not going to know everything. So I would say, not to be a smart ass, but, but, but kind of everything. Uh, I don't know if that's cheating on the answer, but. No, that's, you know, that's a good answer, so. actually. I'm trying to gear this podcast to mostly newbie filmmakers. So as a newbie filmmaker, you end up writing your own script. Mm -hmm. So do you have any words of advice for those kind of people just kind of starting out doing their second or third script? You know, is there like a process that would help this help them along? So the question is what can beginning screenwriters do or everybody is a beginning screenwriter? Like we're beginning filmmakers. Okay. If you, if you're, if you just think you have this passion for filmmaking and you have, I mean, like I did, I, I wrote one script. I wrote, I did one film myself over the summer and it sucked bad. You know what (laughs) I mean? And it's like, I know if I did like 10 more, they'd get better and better. And that's probably part of your answer doing more and more, but you know, try to give them some boost. Well, no matter what you're going to be like, if you're going to be an editor or DP, uh, 
you need to understand storytelling. So writing screenplays is, is good for everybody. And sure, you have to start there. But one of the things that I don't like is that, uh, I don't know if hobbyists is the word or amateurs, uh, filmmakers is they, maybe they're the most talented, they're the most experienced in their group, or they're in film school, uh, you know, maybe not UCLA or USC. And they're like, wow, I'm pretty good. And maybe they are. They're like one of the, the most talented filmmakers. They want to then do everything themselves. They want to write it and be the DP and be the editor and be the producer and maybe be the cinematographer. And when you're starting out, that's good. That's a great way to learn. You can learn everything. However, very quickly, you need to basically understand the process. You should be hoping to find people who are better than you at each of their individual jobs. Like you want the writer who's a really good writer to write it so you can direct. But then also you want the person... Uh, I would say guy, guy or girl, male or female, who's the best DP and who's the best editor. You want to put those together because filmmaking is a collaborative thing. Like I said, you don't know what you're not good at. So it's like you focus on getting better at this one thing while developing overall skills, but let the person who's put the hundred of hours in as a DP be that person, let the person who put a hundred hours in. So eventually, like if even if you're doing a short film, you know, in town here, just kind of as a hobby, like, you know what, if you're going to be the director, Maybe don't be the actor. If you're going to be the director, maybe have someone write it. So it's like some of the people you've had in this podcast, like I, you know Jesse and Brian, they had uh, a friend of mine, Samantha, who's an actress. They wrote a script. And, you know, Brian was in it with them and then produced it. And then Jesse, uh, I don't think I've even met Jesse, but like, you know, he directed it. Uh, I think he shot it. I like the idea that you have to learn to trust other people and actually you want them to be better at uh, what they do. Because you would ask me what other roles I take on, on films, and it's like, well, I've been producer and I've been director. And I kind of kid, it's like, I know enough about everything to, to be dangerous. Like, as a director, I know what everybody should do and want them to do and, like, encourage them to do it. But I'm not, like, you know, like, I'm not very great at sitting down and being an editor. I've taught, I've taught editing. I can do it very slowly. I'm very good working with an editor. I've taught cinematography, but I wouldn't call myself a cinematographer. I would never, ever really shoot something other than, like, you know, friends and family, you know. Jet skiing or something, <laughs> but but it's like but I know that so it's like that's part of the reason why I don't do a whole bunch of little you know smaller films because I'm like I know like I know what other people don't know like I know what every position can do and how it can be great so it's like man if I can't get the resources to let everybody help me be better and, and give let me give them the resources to make them better I, it, it's a little bit frustrating for me it's like you know that's why writing is a little more fulfilling in some ways than directing because, you know, you own it, it's yours, you control it, you can do it without other people's resources. What about when that director takes off on a tangent? Are you okay with that? If I'm the writer? Yeah, if it's your piece, you've written it, and it gets into the director's hands, and he's sort of... If it's business, if it's Hollywood, like, first of all, you're probably not even allowed on the set to even watch it happen. And then and basically, yeah, I would say if, you know, you've been paid and it's like, you know what, shut up, like, because you're not going to be allowed to be on the set. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Like, it's a director's medium, you know, like, it's like being the director on TV. It's like, no, it's usually a producer's medium, uh, except for some of those auteur driven stuff that I was talking about. So when you do a 48 hour film project, yes, I think that's where it gets interesting. Like, you know, you can be a consensus you could all kind of direct or you guys can have a conversation about it. Yeah, that's probably where it happens or where you might even have like, you know, outrage or dismay. However, you know, in the business, it's like, yeah, no. I mean, you know, pick the director you think's good. Pick the director who has a track record. Uh, maybe figure this stuff out beforehand. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like I understand the director hat. I understand the producer hat. And I understand the, writer, understand the writer hat. So it's like when I'm in that role, um, I feel like I try to be respectful of, you know, where I am, you know, in the process. See, I've sort of brought up the idea a couple of times on a couple of these podcasts that I think some people that like there, there tends to be different kind of filmmakers or some people are writers. They want to bring this story together, but some are visual people mm -hmm. that they're going to gravitate towards the DP kind of position. But in the meantime, I think those DP kind of people should seek out like the Carnegie screenwriters or yes. whatever match up because there's all these people that want to get their screenplays to life. Listen, I, I have like dozens of friends in, in Carnegie Screenwriters. And I would say, I mean, this would be self-admitted that, you know, a lot of them amateurs is something they do for fun. If you want to be productive about it or be the producer, well, let's see, there's an MFA in dramaturgy at CMU. There's a bunch of film students at, uh, you know, Point Park. And also you can actively look for, yeah, other professional writers. Like, look, someone like me, especially right now, it's like, yeah, I mean... My, I might have a five-figure rate to do, you know, a 
a, a low budget feature film or something, but like you find a writer that's really good, writers want to work. So it's like, hey, would you write me a five page short for a thousand bucks or 500 bucks? But I know your rate's like $75,000 to do a feature, but would you do it? Like you might find somebody. So it's like, I agree with you. CSW is a great resource, but also there are other resources too. But yeah, like if you want to be a really great director and you're a pretty good writer, why wouldn't you find the great script, you know, or even commission it, you know, be a producer, commission it or, or get three or four writers and tell them about the idea and see if they want to do it on spec. Or if you love their samples, maybe you pay them a little bit or you bring them on as a producer. So yeah, like I'm not a great producer. Like I'm not the kind of guy who like crunches numbers and budgets and stuff. I'm about seeing what people are good at and like championing them and like getting that out of them. So it's like, yes, that skill of knowing who's good at the things you're not good at. Yes, that's a great skill. But that's something you should be doing. That's good. Structure wise, what's the biggest difference between a short and a feature? Well, I think so many people think a short is a feature that's short. And it's it's not really. It's like a short usually is like a puzzle. It's like quippy. It's like, you know, boom, 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 boom. It's like a commercial. You know, there's one little twist or one little build up. And it's like so tight and so efficient that there's you could have dialogue, but like a lot of times it's not dialogue and it's to set up. Like you might have 30 seconds to set it up or you, you might actually start in media res. You might start at the beginning before the inciting incident. So I think the classical short is like a very quippy, quick thing you construct that's like a, almost like engineering machine-like efficiency. And a feature, you know, can have characters and some development and set up. And then you can massage it and you're exploring these themes, you know, up and down and and contrasting characters to, you know, come to this ultimate resolution. So I think storytelling in general, it's a skill that goes back and forth, but it's kind of a different beast. Like I said, I I feel like narrative storytelling, filmmaking, exploring characters, taking your time with uh, a story is something that I gravitate to that I like. And it's, it's almost like making shorts is almost like a whole different beast. Now, like, if you make a 15-minute short, you're right, it can be dialogue, and it can be almost like a short feature. But I think the pure short film is kind of like a different genre. It's like it's like a short story versus a novel. A novel will be a story, a journey. Maybe it's inner. It'll be, you know, you're taking on this thing. But a short story might not even be a story. It might just be a moment, a glimpse, a feeling. And I feel like that's more what um, shorts are. Or if you're telling a story, it's just about you know, the action, boom, 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 no fat, uh, just pure momentum because you don't have any space for fat because in a two, three minute film, 10 seconds is eternity as far as like, you know, boring someone or getting slow or making a mistake or something that's not necessary. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but (laughs) that's good. Why do you think people even bother making shorts? Well, back to that deliberate practice, you got to get experience somehow. I mean, it's good storytelling experience to be making it and you learn things on set that you don't learn anywhere else like you said you made a film and you thought you thought it was horrible but guess what you're a better filmmaker now right because you can tell me and this is why this is why it's always hard for a first-time director to get the first-time director because like you know i directed the first film and i actually thought i did okay but it's like oh man i would never hire a first-time director because i get it so it's like uh no i think it's good experience but like if you don't want to be a director then at some point making amateurish, quick little rough around the edges uh, movies. We don't have a whole bunch of control. It doesn't help a director, but as a writer or screenwriter, it's like, well, you have to, you know, 48 hour film festival where you write in six hours. That's cool. That's good exercise. And if you're good at it, you know, chicken egg, you'll probably write a good script or that struggle to write that script so fast will help your screenwriting. But then you have to polish and get to a point where you rewrite something 20 times and do 30 drafts and get to a level so that, those things you don't know when you see somebody else is better than you, you start knowing them and you start kind of figuring them out. Because I think there's two ways to get some information or there are two ways I've gotten information that no one else knows for making films. Just because if you see an actor, they won't do a line like Kurtwood Smith on Hard Scrambled. He just wouldn't do a line, not because it's being difficult, because it was like he knew the writer was kind of forcing it and it was exposition. He just wouldn't say it. So it's like, you know what? Now I see. I'm not going to write exposition. I'm not going to write a bad line of exposition because I want to force it in there because, man, I'm doing a disservice and people won't do it. And the other way that you learn stuff that deep down secrets that no one else knows is rewriting. Most 95% or more writers 
don't get to a 10th or 15th or 12th draft where they're like having epiphanies and seeing things and having stuff come to life. So back to the expectations, they don't even know what they're aiming for. So it's like, uh, yeah, you can keep making movies, but also if you want to be a screenwriter, you got to write and you got to figure out some way to get your deliberate practice, to get feedback, to get people who are better than you. Start working on projects where people are better than you. Because back to that thing as a director, you can be the director with a whole bunch of your friends and make five films, but what about the time when you like get professionals surrounding you who are all professionals and better at what they do than you? That's how you're going to learn. That's how you're going to be better. So it's like you have to balance with like not be super goal oriented and, and have friends and do stuff and have it be fun. But also if you want to be taken professionally or if you want it to be a career as a goal, figure out some way to uh, be constantly rising up and uh, engaging and interacting and learning from people who are better than you. We're always trying to basically get better. That's excellent. So what do you like best about screenwriting? What is it that like draws you to it? What, what, what's, what trips your trigger about it? Why not novels or screenwriting? I think is like pure storytelling. Like a novel, the medium of novels is words. You take words and you put them together, you create like a higher meaning. But screenwriting is like no, you're taking psychology, you're taking actions and visuals and character choices and putting them together to create higher meaning. So as someone who's sort of a dilettante of psychology and try to figure people out, the idea when you can capture someone you know, wordlessly or without saying it or something that's true, but it's not spoken. It's implicit. Um, it's, it's very intuitive. Like I'm a very intuitive person. So the idea that what's in my mind can be explained without being explained or understood without having to put it in the concrete form of words, I, you know, I, I kind of like that, like an ellipsis or an absence of something or a cut can be all the meaning, you know, in, you know, in a movie or film. So I feel like storytelling is the thing that I love about it, that it's psychology, there's people that's understanding, and it's also visual. Like as an extrovert, interacting with people and watching them and reading them. Um, I just, for me, it's just, it's kind of like, I haven't given a lot of thought to that because it's like, duh, it's not really a choice. It just kind of is. Hmm. What do you like least about it? Screenwriting? Writing. writing. <laughs> well, I mean, sitting in a room for a thousand hours and staring at a computer you know, it's tough for anybody, but like as an extrovert, man, it's, it would, if I could be, you know, like if I could be Spielberg and just show up, or Woody Allen, once a year, show up and direct a movie, I don't like, yeah, I'd probably write a screenplay every few years. Like there'd be a story that comes up where I'd want to develop or, or maybe even pay someone else to write. But, um, but like, it's just, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. It's tough. Like I don't have 30 screenplays in me. Like I don't, I'm not a person who just like knocks out cool high concept scripts because man, I, you know, I want to be a screen artist. Like I have a story to tell, that story will come up and then, you know, every year I'll probably find something that's important enough to me. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. So what are some of the resources in town here? Well, you know, the Pittsburgh Film Commission isn't a bad thing. However, it's not really for, you know, people like us who are maybe making low budget, low budget movies or making two, three thousand dollar short or 48 hour film festival type stuff. They're trying to, you know, give tax breaks to people spending millions of dollars. So I don't know that they're a great resource, but I'll tell you who's an amazing resource is Steel Town now. Uh, Marianne and Wendy over there have been so helpful in so many different ways. And like, as a concrete tool, for instance, like they have this partnership where you can align with them and people can invest or donate to your film, but it goes through them. But then you get the write-off of being a nonprofit. So if your rich Uncle Fred is going to give you a couple thousand bucks to kind of uh, you know help you out and help your career out, he has a full tax write-off as a nonprofit, and it comes to you for like a nominal fee. So they have some really concrete tools and ways to help filmmakers. So yeah, I think uh, you know Steel Town is you know an amazing resource. What are some projects you're currently working on? I was ready to shoot a short. A film, actually a client of mine from Canada came into a Pittsburgh for a class I did last year. And she liked it so much. We worked with the actors, some of the local actors, that she said, let's do something down here. So basically, we were ready to shoot like a three-day a three day short in uh, either March or May. And then obviously all this, the world blew up. So there's that. And then I just finished my feature in my dramedy. So I'm like, I was marketing that. Same thing. It's like hard to get people to read right now. And then I have a couple little things, like like a play, just as a little side exercise. I have a, I have a little assignment to do with someone else's uh, pilot or second script in their series. And I'm just going to figure out what's next, either a, probably like a half-hour pilot or 
another, another uh, feature film. So yeah, I'm kind of like figuring stuff out, thinking about this production, and then basically jump back into a script in the next, I don't know, probably two months. What are some books that you would recommend new filmmakers read? Filmmakers? I think David Mamet's film on directing is great. Linda Sager's book, Making a Good Script, great. Even though it's kind of for screenwriters, it's so specific and meticulous about the structure of uh, Back to the Future. Like you're, you're understanding, like if you want to make a short film, your understanding of how Back to the Future works in a two-hour landscape and how it's so intricate, it's, it's a really great book. Also, I actually, I mean, I'm plugging, but not really, my book on scene writing, the first ever book that was focusing on scenes, the craft of scene writing, for all kinds of storytellers, songwriters, blogs, actors, producers, I think it's actually, um, you know, I used to get defensive about it, like, oh, it's a, it's a niche. It's not. It's actually scene writing is, is storytelling in its purest form. It's like a story there in one page or two pages. I think that's good. This has been really good. I. I really appreciate what you've been oh, doing. Thanks. So how can people get a hold of you if they want to hire you? My website, jamespmercurio.com, has my consulting there. I, I, I have a service that I like to do. And obviously, you know, as a business person, oh, it's my big service. It's nice. It's, it's nice to do it. But it's called coaching. And what I like about it is that rather than me just giving you 20 pages of notes, which I have a service, like I can bombard you and I can give you 20 pages of notes and they'll be good notes and you'll be learning a lot from them. But like the coaching is like, you know what? We're doing three or four drafts. So it's very organic. I can follow through and be like, you know what? Let's talk about big picture. Let's talk about structure. Uh, okay, let's tweak some sequences. Now let's talk about characters and dialogue and scene. So it's a very much a back and forth. As a story analyst, it's like my job is to be good at giving specifics. And I know I was playfully talking about, hey, it's not special. Um, a lot of times, if you're not great at giving notes, you shouldn't try to fix it. You should just give them the problem and let them figure it out. I happen to be pretty good at doing that. So that's what I do. And it's back to that deliberate practice. I don't have to be the only way for you to get mentoring or insight or being pushed or have your eyes open to this, but I or other people like me were definitely one way. So it's like, yeah, jamespmercurio.com. My email is jim at there. You know what? Especially right now, you're a beginner. You have a passion project. Money's an issue. I'd say come talk to me. I've lowered my prices because of uh, kind of the quarantine and the pandemic, but like the same way with my writing, like I want to do important stuff. I want to, I want to make things that matter. So it's like, if you come to me with your story, uh, you know, I will be flexible and try to, uh, you know, figure out a way to help you. And I think you should also check out my book, The Craft of Scene Writing. It's the only book out there that focuses just on scenes for, for movies. So it's like, um, I can say it's like, yeah, it's, there's only one place you can get that. And it would be definitely helpful for no matter what, editor, producer, cinematographer, actor, director, I think it'll be helpful for everybody. If we come to you, can we get a signed copy? Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I have a box full of them. So uh, <laughs> yeah, PayPal me with like uh, three bucks for uh, first class, eight bucks for- uh, Heck, or, we can drive to your probably, house. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I should have brought you one, by the way. I'm sorry. I, I, That's okay. I, 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 will I wasn't hinting one. about no, it. No, I will bring you one. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to say as a parting shot to the local filmmaking community? You had Brian Saponis on, I don't know, a few weeks ago, or that's when I heard it. And uh, he came to a reading of mine from one of my scripts, so I got to get uh, get to know him a little bit better. And one of the things he said, and he said it a lot nicer than I might have said, he was like, you know, when he was in Los Angeles, the competition and the expectation of just what is good is higher. So it's like, I don't want you to aim to be the big fish in a small pond. I want you to be aiming to be the big fish in the big pond. Like, Like, you have to... Your reach has to exceed your grasp. You have to be aiming to make Oscar-winning movies to make pretty good movies. <laughs> and you have to aim somehow higher to make really great movies. So it's like, don't limit your vision, but also like, you know, push yourself out of your comfort zone. Don't try to do it all yourself. Try to find allies who can compliment you, not compliment with an I, but with an E, like who can like, you know, cover your weaknesses. And basically um, just work hard. Like basically... Always, 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 your script can be rewritten. It can always be kind of made better. And I'm not saying be neurotic and never, ever finish something, but basically just raise your expectations. And when you see something that's really great and you can't quite explain it, just keep aiming for it. Like, I don't have to be the one to show you how to get from A to Q, but if you see Q or Z or whatever it is, find your own way, but stay on that path. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Okay, well. I don't know, does this, this work? Do we get stuff? Yeah, we got it. Thank you very much. Do, do I, I appreciate it. And we're. Uh, I'll let you know when we, we publish, okay? Okay, that's awesome.
Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you found us on our webpage, please leave a comment and let us know what you think. If you found us on iTunes or Spotify and you like the show, please leave a rating or review. And whatever you do, hit the subscribe button. Thanks again, and we'll be here next week with another episode.